Howdy, welcome to another episode of Think Theism, Apologetics and Theology here at Texas A&M. My name is Zach. I am joined by my co-host and Punnett Square dancing instructor, Andrew. Hello. Our guest today is Dr. Joshua Swamidas. He is Associate Professor of Pathology and Immunology at Washington University in St. Louis with a joint appointment in Biomedical Engineering, the best engineering. And he's the author of the new book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry, which is available now from InterVarsity Press. How are you doing today, Dr. Swamidas? Doing great, thank you for having me. Yeah, so you're in town for the Veritas Forum. Um, is this your first time in College Station? Yeah, it is. Is it is Aggie Land living up to all the the mythos that has uh, come? Well, with I'm it? not aware of the mythos. Oh, really? <laughs> so, but that's because uh, well, now now I'm probably uh, distancing myself unintentionally from the audience. So yes, <laughs> it's lived up to the mythos. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we, uh, A&M's got a special place in its own weird tradition history. But uh, in any event, you're here for the Veritas Forum. Uh, you'll be in dialogue with Dr. Michael Behe. So. The title is God and or Evolution, which is intentionally clickbait. It is intentionally obfuscating to get people to come in the door. So what is what is your general position uh, that you'll be taking? So I'm a Christian that affirms evolutionary science. And mm -hmm. if you think I fit into one of the predetermined pigeonholes, it turns out that I kind of don't. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are people talk about, you know, young earth creationism, old earth creationism, evolutionary creation or intelligent design. I see a lot of legitimacy in each one of these positions, and also I have some significant disagreements. And, mm -hmm. um, and that is one of the things I'm really hoping to explore with Michael Behe. So Michael Behe is one of the leaders in the intelligent design movement. Mm -hmm. And if you want a preview, uh, I think I find a lot of stuff that I really agree with him about, but there's some differences, and I think those differences are important because I, I think that, the, that there's a better way forward available mm -hmm. right now in a way where we don't have to be so... Uh, much in conflict and start engaging better conversations together. And so I, I want to I see if maybe we can hash out a better way forward. Mm -hmm. Right. If an evolutionary scientist and uh, an intelligent design person agrees, then maybe there's, some, uh, maybe there's a path forward there. Right? Well, I don't know, actually, if Michael <laughs> Behe agrees with me on that better way. I think he has his way, but that's okay. I mean, I think even if – we'll see. Maybe he will want a better way forward. But I, but I think the bigger question is going to be for the audience, you know, Mm -hmm. So I was at graduate school when I first heard, sorry, not at graduate school, undergrad. Mm -hmm. In 1998, when I first heard about Michael Behe and read Darwin's Black Box, and we didn't know then where it would go in science. You know, mm -hmm. Now we're 22 years later. We know where it's gone. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't gone as far as, as they hoped and wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and it feels a little bit stuck at times. And mm -hmm. so you know, is there a better way forward? I think there is. I think we should look for it. Okay. Um, I think it would be helpful to talk a little bit more about your science background. Uh, so I mentioned you're at Washington University in St. Louis, and you're in biomedical engineering. Uh, I know that's your second title, but for me, that's the most important. So, <laughs> uh, so, so what uh, what is your day job is effectively? What's the research you're most focused yeah, so on? So I'm a scientist at a secular university. I don't see patients, even though I have a medical degree, mm -hmm. but I do research. I use artificial intelligence to look at problems at the intersection of biology, chemistry, and medicine, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I do. I'm going to have graduate students. I write papers, uh, write grants, mm -hmm. and most of my my time is spent, well, except for maybe the last couple months with this book, but right. most of my time is spent really trying to make sense of the world alongside other scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that, I, I hate to get a little technical, but indulge me, uh, just a little. Uh, so one of the things that you've been working on in particular is um, Machine learning for predicting, uh, I'm going to screw this up, metabolism of, I think it's P540? Is that the right one? Well, P450. Yeah, so, we, we, so yeah, a go. big part of what my group does is try and model how your body metabolizes or changes drug molecules mm -hmm. uh, when they're in the bloodstream. And that's important because it turns out a lot of drugs become toxic after metabolism. Mm -hmm. And so we've been studying that from several different angles. And I think it's really important work because it could show us how to make drugs more effectively. Mm -hmm. and understand why drugs become toxic and how to make them less toxic. Okay, so it, basically um, trying to be able to better predict which drugs are going to have adverse reactions and which ones are going to be safe. For and why, so we can them. fix it too. Okay. Uh, I would actually like to stay there a lot longer, but I know we're going to lose our audience. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's pivot a little here. Uh, so you mentioned you're a confessing uh, Christian in the sciences. Uh, Andrew and I both are broadly in that field, and uh, a lot of Christians who are in STEM usually at some point have that, you know, science versus faith uh, 
collision, um, whether it's manufactured or whether it's just in the culture. So um, how has that gone for you as far as navigating the science-faith uh, dialogue? Well, I mean, you're very perceptive. That's exactly what happens. Um, it tends to be very private conflicts for a lot of people because it's not something that the church has always been good at talking about. It's also not something that science has been good at talking about all the time. And so it ends up being a pretty personal and pretty jarring challenge for a lot of us. So I was raised on Earth creationist. I ended up moving to the point of view as a Christian who affirms uh, science, and it was really for three reasons. One is I, I couldn't actually find why there was any conflict between science, evolutionary science, mm -hmm. and even a very strict literal reading of Genesis. Uh, that's one one thing that's there, and people never really believed me on that, but that's why this book ended up getting being written. Mm -hmm. That was probably the key thing to make me be even open to look at the evidence for itself. And when I actually saw the evidence, especially as a biologist for myself, I saw very compelling evidence for common descent. Mm -hmm. That is an evidence against God's action and origins or against his providence. God governs the cast of dice or the cast of lots, but I can't prove that scientifically. And I'm really comfortable with that from a theological point of view. And uh, science doesn't really tell us that God doesn't govern the cast of lots. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, you know, I think God governs evolution. And I can see that it really looks like we share common ancestors with the great apes. All right. The third thing was, so even after that was there, it was still difficult. And what the real issue was is that I was replacing my confidence in arguments against evolution. Mm -hmm. Somehow I'd really come to believe that there's some sort of confidence in my faith because I can somehow show that evolution is true. And I'm supposed to be in resistance to that somehow. And uh, the thing about it is scripture doesn't really teach that. Uh, that's not how confidence comes from. Confidence, faith, faith comes from what God did in history to reveal himself to this man, Jesus, by raising him physically from the dead. And so as I kind of let down or left my anti-evolution idols and found my confidence in the resurrection, mm -hmm. um, there was just no longer any reason. And, and for me, that's why I, that's my path to confident faith, where mm -hmm. it involves leaving evolution, or my yeah. opposition to evolution, to be okay affirming it. Yeah, and um, placing my confidence in what God did in history through through Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I think it's I think it's hard to overstate the importance of this type of a, a sort of testimony um, in our in our world today. Because I'm not sure how much you follow um, uh, like popular culture, but there have been a a slew of um, public figures who have publicly renounced Christianity. Um, revolving around issues of uh, either of science or uh, social justice type issues um, who are very, very public in, you know, dis discussing why they have left the faith um, and, and documenting these uh, challenges that they experience. But we have relatively few people who go through the same, you know, many people go through that same process but come out on the end still as believers. But how frequently do we hear from those people who say, yes, I, I started out believing this and I struggled with my faith. And at the end of the day, I came out and I changed my views and I'm still a believer. I, I didn't have to throw out Christianity because um, I decided that the earth was, you know, four billion years old. Um, so I, I really appreciate um people like you willing to, to kind of walk through that step and how, how they went through that path because it's a nice counter to, um, I think what we have now is a, a, a wide range of, of testimony from people who have left the faith for similar reasons. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I, think, I think you're right. I think it is important. Um, I think there's an importance that we need really confession. We need to confess. We need to declare publicly with our mouths what we've actually seen. And I think also I'd add to what you're saying is that some of the people who've talked about this story of kind of moving away from young earth creationism have done it in a way that ultimately I think ends up being unproductive. What they do is they frame it as a conflict between scripture and science, even if they remain Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes that's what happens. And, and what I've really noticed to be remarkable, there are definitely exceptions to this, but quite often they're, you're still not left with an understanding of why they're still Christian. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is they don't actually really talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, what happened was that, well, 
to be clear, I'm extremely sympathetic to these deconversion stories. Because frankly, if I hadn't encountered Jesus, I would be one of those stories. I would probably be an atheist or an agnostic right now. Because mm-hmm. when I looked at the church, I see legitimacy in what they're saying, frankly. Mm-hmm. When I look at the church, it's a really broken thing quite often. Mm-hmm. It's very ugly at times. When you look at how it's dealt with issues of race, mm-hmm. sexuality, not just, in, certainly in our generation, but even if you go back just 50 years, uh, and you see these issues, and you see, you know, you know, for being people who proclaim to be talking about an all-benevolent, all-powerful God, it seems to be a, a very man-made religion. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of the ancillary things that have been added onto it, and even more so just with the whole rise of the religious right in the 80s and every political yeah, thing. and it's on every level. On. Like, you know, we these mm-hmm. things that are just so clearly... Mm-hmm man's ideas that are somehow not being substituted as god's word for like people who claim to care about god's word you know i i you know i i I understand why people are disgusted by that frankly i have a hard time not being disgusted i mean i am disgusted by it let's just say that so i looked around and i saw that and i wanted to know well you know is there anything in this faith that's that's real meaning beyond merely constructed by man anything that's not constructed here I was an elementary school kid or a junior high kid when I was asking this, so I did not use the word constructed. (laughs) (laughs) But I was really wondering, is there anything here that's not man-made? Is there anything that lets me know this is true beyond merely the fact that my parents tell me it's true? And the one thing I found is what God did in history through Jesus. And when I looked at Jesus, he looked good. Well, I wondered if the church was good, Jesus was good. Mm -hmm. And... While I wondered about God existed, I couldn't explain that he rose from the dead unless God existed. Mm-hmm. And while I still can't really grasp the fact w- about why the creator of all things would actually care to know us and to know me, mm-hmm. I find out through Jesus that he does. So I don't understand it, but I can accept that it's true. So, that, so that's why I say it's through Jesus that I know that God, that, that God exists, that he's good, and that he wants to be known. And that's greater than anything I find in science. And so this is like a different sort of story, I would say, than sometimes I hear about how amazing science is, and therefore we should kind of let go of some traditional views of scripture or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I agree that science is amazing, but I have not found anything in science that compares with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in a lot of these stories of deconversion, one thing you'll find is that there are a couple things. Either Jesus is very absent and they don't ever mention him, Mm -hmm. but also often you'll hear that they're still finding Jesus to be compelling. Mm-hmm. And so I think one thing that we have to have discernment to really look at, are they really leaving Jesus or are they leaving the church? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if they leave the church, I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but my goodness, that should call out an immense amount of empathy because Jesus is greater than the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know that I could really put it any better than that. That's that. So much of that resonates with, 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 with my own story. I, I mean, I came from a very fundamentalist background, um, but it was uh, mostly through, like, the fundamentalist Pentecostal movement. And for me, you know, speaking in tongues that was super real, and, and that was, like, the foundation of everything. Um, and then once I... And the strangest thing happened is that whenever I encountered evidence that the earth was old, for some reason, I couldn't speak in tongues anymore. It was the weirdest thing. Um, and it was... And so obviously my conclusion was, well, if the earth is old and I can't speak in tongues, then obviously everything is made up and I should throw out all of it completely. But, you know, the same same exact thing, you know, you come back to Jesus. Once you, you peel back whatever tradition you've been on and you look at what the man from Nazareth actually had to say, you realize there's so much more there than just whatever stuff has been layered on top of it. And, and, and I completely agree. That's exactly where uh, the path that I've taken and I resonate so much with that. Um, Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection and all the other stuff is completely ancillary, I think. Um, man, that's such a good topic. It's so hard to pivot from that. <laughs> so, well, that's how it's supposed to be, right? Right, yeah. When we sit down and talk, yeah. um, and, and when you think about what the voice, our voice should be in, in the secular mm-hmm. world, yeah. yeah, it is about our stories, but our stories are supposed to be submitted to the Lordship of Christ. Mm-hmm. And... And so, 
this is something where I think, like I said, there are certainly uh, people doing what I'm saying. It's not like that, that's not what, what I'm trying to say, but often, you know, it's just missing in the conversation origins. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only time that, well, not the only time, usually the way that Jesus enters the conversation is a threatened bystander mm -hmm. that might somehow be injured or vanish or poof into non-existence mm -hmm. because of some sort of human debate and that he needs our defense mm -hmm. somehow. And I just got to tell you, when I read scripture, when I see Jesus in the garden, when the soldiers come, And I feel that need to leap to his defense. Mm -hmm. You know, what I find in scripture is not a person who needs my defense. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Jesus of scripture is not a threatened bystander. Yeah. He is powerful. He doesn't access power the way I would. He does not call down the armies of the angels down to deal with those. He works his purposes for in this world and, and through me in ways that I do not expect and I do not understand, and they're not the way I would do it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't do it through power in the yeah. way I would expect because he, has, he doesn't do it through human power in the way I expect because he has access to power far beyond that. That's kind of what I find through, through that. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about the defense. Apologetics is mm -hmm. based on the Greek word apologia. It's often translated defense. That's how Ratio Christi defines it often. Most of the time, yeah. However, it has another explanation, which is much more theologically grounded, especially in the context. Do you know what that word is, or the definition is? Um, so I think it's something to the effect of like witness or... Something explanation. Like explanation? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so you could say, does Jesus need our defense? Mm -hmm. I think that... No halfway sensible reading of scripture could possibly leave us with the view that Jesus needs our defense. Mm. He doesn't. But he is a curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's non-intuitive. It doesn't make sense. And he, in fact, invites our explanation. In discussion, yeah. And so I think, you know, a theologically grounded apologetics is not a defense. It is an explanation. Mm -hmm. Right. You're not trying to protect the bystander. I really like that analogy. You're not trying to protect the, the bystander, but he does, you're actually listening to the bystander and trying to understand what he's talking about, right? Yeah, and then that just becomes this overwhelming thing that takes over the whole conversation because it's beautiful. And here we are, and that's exactly what's going on now. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so... Uh, for those who want to kind of explore this a little more, there's a couple things I'll point to. One is I learned out that this crazy view I'm talking about is actually not that crazy. It's just, it's actually traditional Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, when the early church faced the lines in the Colosseum, as it wasn't because of a young earth creationism mm -hmm. of any sort. It was because of, because they had actually said with their mouth that Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar. Mm -hmm. And they believed in their hearts that doing this at the risk of death was worthwhile because Jesus rose from the dead and they would too. And so, so that's like a core Christianity piece. Uh, I've been talking to Lutherans a lot at Concordia mm -hmm. Seminary. Um, I'm not Lutheran, but Lutherans have something correct. They say that, you know, we believe the Bible because of Jesus, not the other way around. It's not that we believe Jesus because of the Bible. So that epistemological ordering is, I think, important. And if you want to know more about my story, there's an article online at peacefulscience.org called Finding Confident Faith in Science, where I explain some of this in a little more in detail. Mm. Well, that, that's such a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we'll, of course, have you back here in a few minutes for another episode <laughs> in real time, in podcast time. That might be another uh, week or so that you have to wait for the next <laughs> installment. But we're going to jump a little bit more into... Uh, the genealogical Adam next time. So thank you very much. This goes to prove your scripts don't make any weird worthless. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think. It, yeah, but isn't that how it's supposed to be? It is. Jesus takes it is. over everything. <laughs> it is. It is. What an apt metaphor. I was literally thinking that. Okay. Thanks for listening to this episode. Think Theism is made in association with Russia Christie at Texas A&M University. We invite you to join the weekly Russia Christie meetings every Thursday at 8:30 p.m. The views and opinions that are expressed in all of our episodes are of the speakers only and are not necessarily endorsed by Rasha Christie 
nor by Texas A&M University. For more information, go to thinktheism.org.